Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from Dr. Lillis's lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He's an author of several books, including Hidden Mountain's Secret Garden, A Theological Contemplation on Prayer, and Fire from Above, Christian Contemplation and Mystical Wisdom. In this particular series of conversations, We'll focus on the spiritual writings of St. Teresa of Avila, and in particular, her autobiography. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We now continue with part two of our conversation. Now, Anthony, there may be listeners out there who will hear about this experience that she has, that with this good book, The Third Spiritual Alphabet, and they'll say, well, I need to run out and go get that book. And I'm going to need to read that too. What would you advise folks as they begin to hear about the spiritual reading of those great spiritual saints that we get to know? My concern is that we might be resting with something that is really fruitful for us. We might be just running from book to book. I don't know. Teresa might smack me on the head for that one. But I mean, what's your thought? I think there's, there's two things. In the beginning of the spiritual life, I think it's really important to do a lot of spiritual reading, a lot of reading of good spiritual books. And Osuna's book is one of the great spiritual classics, so no harm would come from reading it. So that's that's just true in general. If we want to live a prayerful life, we need to find good prayerful literature. We need to spend a little bit less time watching YouTube and following the news, the latest news stories, and a little bit more time learning how to read. This is a big problem we have in our culture today is that we've lost the art of reading and we have struggles paying attention for longer periods of time. Reading is one of those practices, of, if it's done prayerfully, that can lead into a, a deeper recollection, a, a state of soul that's very, very good for our humanity. And so, so I'd, I would never want to discourage anyone from reading. But Chris, you've also brought up another problem that happens. Sometimes somebody gets so into reading spiritual literature, they substitute reading one book after another after another for time that they ought to be wasting with the Lord. I I speak about contemplative prayer or this prayer of recollection is in a certain way wasting time with the Lord. You're not achieving anything. You're not learning anything. You're not getting any more information. You're just allowing yourself to rest in his presence, to rest in his goodness, as she says in this particular chapter. And that activity is so important. So here we get to, I think, the meat of your criticism that is kind of an enemy for contemplative prayer. And that is today, especially our souls, because of technology, because of the amount of information that is at our fingertips, we're kind of information junkies. And so we need to act against that tendency by doing what you just said, Chris, and that is discerning carefully our spiritual reading. This is where having a good spiritual friend or a spiritual director or even a priest that you can talk to from time to time kind of direct you to literature that will be most beneficial for you so that you're not chasing everything down. Here on Discerning Hearts, again, one of the beauties of this particular resource, Chris, that you have uh, so uh, generously put together for all, all of us is that it has shows like this where you get to really hunker down into a particular book and read along with these discussions. So if there are those of you who are listening to these podcasts, I highly, highly recommend that you I uh, get the book, The Life of Teresa of Avila or uh, La Vida de uh, Teresa de Jesus. And I invite you to read along the chapters as we go through these conversations. And the idea of these conversations is to help the text 
come more alive for you. And so going back to your question, Chris, should we, when we hear about things that Teresa of Avila reads, is it good to kind of note that? Should we look at that? It could be good for us, but I'd bounce it off. Everybody has is in such a different place. On the whole, those who are trying to make a good beginning, it's it's good for you to read a little bit more. And on the whole, for those of you who made a good beginning, but the Lord is inviting to for you to spend a little bit more time in silence, you know, you need to be cautious about filling up that time of silence with becoming an information junkie. You need to be surrendered to the love of the Lord. You need to learn to rest in his goodness for this prayer of recollection to bear fruit in your life. I'm so glad you said that, because if you can take into context the time that Teresa's living in, that's the 1500s. Books are now available to people, but not at to the extent that they are today. She didn't have a UPS truck drop off, you know, a stack that would just purchase quickly on the internet. And I think that's all good. I mean, there is great spiritual reading out there and there's writing that's happening. However, taking the time, if you can put it in the context of Teresa, here she's given the advice to read this book. I can just imagine her sitting there going back and rereading it over and over and looking at it and contemplating it. And I think more importantly, absorbing what she is reading to the extent that I think that's the the real value. So again, I feel free to correct me. She's encouraging people to yes, read spirit good spiritual works from spiritual masters, but don't become a, sp- a spiritual reading glutton. I mean, and where you're in today's world, where that it, it it can happen, and you're not really absorbing anything that is t- can take hold. That may be very judgmental of me. I I pr- hope people will forgive me if they think I am be. And have that disposition. Well, no, there's kind of like, this is where that a Thomistic teaching on virtue, and you know, in the middle stands virtue, and there's the extreme of reading too much and the extreme of not reading enough. And we have, and we have both problems going on today. We have a whole bunch of people running into silence and spending long hours of silence, and they end up in exercises at best of some sort of mental hygiene, but usually they're never really able to arise very far above their egos. Their exercises, their spiritual exercises are are exercises in self-preoccupation, and they they need a spiritual book in front of them to pull them out of themselves so that they can start thinking about God and the holiness of God that God is calling them into. So we have that kind of need today that we rediscover our Catholic tradition, our Catholic mystical tradition, our Catholic contemplative tradition. And that requires some reading, and it requires when we go into silence, going into the wisdom of of the saints and mystics who came before us and letting them teach us how to enter into the silence. So this is a very, very important thing that my Carthusian brother-in-law told me that you should never go into silence without a good book next to you. On the other hand, and this is where what you're saying, you know, we are such consumers of information, what we end up doing rather than allowing ourselves to rest in the goodness of God, we use our all the sources of information we have at our command to distract ourselves from that goodness. And we don't really rest in it. We rest in information about it. And so this is where what you said about absorbing. When we read for prayer, we read to absorb the truths that God wants us, it desires us to absorb into our hearts so that we can e- enter more deeply into recollection. That's very different than trying to grasp for a whole bunch of information so that we can talk about prayer and talk about prayerful experiences without actually having absorbed the truth allowing it to form our innermost being. Uh, interiority of contemplative prayer, the interiority that recollection demands, 
means allowing the truth of God to come into my heart and cast light on all the broken judgments I've made about myself, about the world, about my neighbor, and about God himself. And as that light is cast upon, I realize there are whole bunches of things that I need to let go of so that I can receive God's judgment into my heart. Insofar as spiritual reading helps us do that, then we want to engage in spiritual reading. Insofar as spiritual reading prevents us from dealing with the repentance, the compunction, the bad judgments that we need to let go of, then that reading is a waste of time. It's not really going to help us enter deep into prayer. We'll return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis. Now, this is exactly what I did and when I'm looking at chapter 7, or not chapter 7, but section 7 in the book, she talks about how she could not, for almost 20 years, find a confessor who understood her. And what she had often was that book who became her spiritual guide. And I have to say, it, Teresa became a spiritual guide for me in that same way back, I would, I would say, uh, several decades ago, before I got to know you and so many others, Teresa of Avila was my spiritual guide and it helped me get through some really difficult times in the church. I'm talking about the 90s. Now I'm dating myself, but back in the 1990s when it was beginning to get very strange. And if I hadn't had Teresa of Avila's writings, I think I would have really gotten lost in the storm. You know, I think that's true for so many of us that struggle to find good spiritual directors. I've been blessed, but my experience is kind of the exception. There are many out there for whom a good spiritual book it becomes their guide. And fortunately, Teresa of Avila is one of those sure guides you can turn to. So entering into these pages, you know, this is also, again, the beauty of discerning hearts. Discerning hearts is kind of a community of friends all over the world where we're praying for each other and praying that we find the guidance we need. And, and so these programs, I think, are helpful precisely to that end. The other thing that's kind of interesting here to note, though, because she doesn't have a guide and because the only guide she has is a good spiritual book, she makes some fundamental mistakes. Part of the chapter now 
kind of moves on to talk about some of those mistakes. Now, as she begins to talk about the mistakes, she notes how much she was blessed, and she refers to, as she's previously referred to the prayer of recollection, and as she practiced recollection, she disposed herself to new movements of the Holy Spirit in her life. And those new movements are the prayer of quiet, and then she also speaks about the prayer of union. In future chapters, we're going to be talking about these kind of prayers. What I want you to see here is that she's really only a beginner in the spiritual life in so many ways. And yet God grants her very more advanced experience of prayer than her actual spiritual maturity would think you would allow you to think was possible. And how do I know that her actual spiritual maturity isn't quite commensurate with the kinds of prayer like the prayer of union or even the prayer of quiet? Well, she says that she was not paying attention to the role of venial sin in her life. And this is where having a good spiritual friend or a good spiritual director can be so helpful at something that a book can't do for you. When you have someone in your life whom you're unburdening your heart to, they're going to be helping you to confront some things that aren't quite comfortable. Moreover, you don't think they're a really big deal. And it's the whole realm of venial sins. Venial sins are not mortal sins. We're not dealing with murdering people or, or destroying people's reputations. We're dealing with more subtle things, an unconscious slip of the tongue where we needed to be a little bit more careful, but we were reckless. It pertains to maybe just a little bit of lethargy in the morning when we need to get up and get going and we have instead of a little bit of a spirit of grumbling. These kinds of things, when they are unchecked, what they will do, no matter how sublime your prayer is, they're going to rob you of those very beautiful graces and they're going to dispose you to falling backwards or backsliding. And so in chapter four, we see that she is, receives this beautiful gift of prayer and that she even enters into mystical range of contemplation, this prayer of quiet, this prayer of union is what, but because she's not careful about venial sin, because venial sin is habitually so much part of her life, it's going to dispose her to a fall and to sliding backwards. And that's what exactly happens. That happens to me all the time, if I'm brutally honest. I mean, th this is, I think, an experience that many of us have, especially, I don't want to say that it doesn't happen in the, in the convent. It doesn't happen within a cloister. Boy, it sure is hard when you're out in the world not to allow yourself to get caught into that venial sin. And I would also say it looks too, doesn't it, like when we are not practicing a life of virtue when we begin to forget the importance of the virtues in our life. Well, that that's true. And this particular virtue that Teresa of Avila hones in on are uh, virtues of prayerfulness. She says she realizes that venial sin was kind of getting a hold and robbing her of certain graces because she didn't really know how to pray that well. She had this book, but she needed someone to accompany her into silence to learn how to use the different faculties of her soul. And so she said, God had not given me the talents for reasoning with the understanding or for making good use of the imagination. My ima imagination is so poor that even when I thought about the Lord's humanity or tried to imagine it to myself as I was in the habit of doing, I never succeeded. And although if they persevere, people may attain more quickly to contemplation by following the method of not laboring with the understanding, it is a very troublesome and, and painful process. For if the will has nothing to employ it, and love has no present object with which to busy itself, the soul finds itself without either support or occupation. Its solitude and aridity cause it great distress. So what she's saying is because no one had really taught her how to pray, how to use her understanding and how to use her imagination well, as the trials of prayer began to 
stand up. That's what aridity is. Aridity is his trial of prayer. What will happen is she'll, instead of persevering through the aridity, she doesn't know how to persevere. She will let go of the practice of prayer. And because she hasn't been vigilant with the venial sins that have begun to build up in her life, those venial sins uh, kind of flow into the, the vacuum and begin to characterize her behavior. It's at this point that she talks about the importance of maintaining purity of conscience. People in this condition need greater purity of conscience than those who can labor with the understanding. For anyone meditating on the nature of the world, on his duties on God, on the great God's great sufferings, and on what he himself is giving to him who loves him, will find in his meditations instructions for defending himself against his thoughts and against the perils and occasions of sin. What she needed to learn to do to keep her conscience clear was to continually turn her thoughts to God and away from self. In the beginning of our spiritual life, the reason why we're inclined to venial sin is because we're filled with a lot of self-occupation and there's a freedom from ourselves that we need to for a life to be lived where we're not sinning venially all the time. We need to be free from ourselves and caught up in the glory of God. And so what she's saying here, this purity of conscience, we need to take into our lives practices whereby we're looking at our life each day and going, well, now, during this period of the day, was I resting in the goodness of God and living according to that goodness was I letting him be supremely good in my life? Or was I letting my own kind of selfish impulses rule the moment? And the idea of this exercise isn't to beat yourself up, but just to notice as, as you see the sin, boy, this is something I want to bring to confession. Boy, this is something I need to submit to the Lord. Lord, help me keep my conscience clean. When you have a pure conscience, power of your understanding, the power of your imagination becomes freer and freer because you're freer and freer from yourself. You're freer to be occupied with God. When you let a whole bunch of little unconscious behaviors continue to go on and on, you never kind of examine yourself to try to find those and call them for what they are. What happens, the unexamined life, the unconscious impulses that kind of build up, those end up defining you when that's not your desire it's not god's desire but because you haven't challenged yourself you haven't kind of looked to find those little areas where where it's not god's will it's my own big fat ego it's i'm not resting in his supreme goodness here in this conversation or with this anxiety or with this resentment or this bitterness or this fear i'm not resting in the goodness of god i'm letting my thoughts get away from me and so here we begin to see one of the great obstacles to going into prayer and that she's beginning to confront here and that causes us to need a good spiritual director, a good spiritual friend, a good community around us is our own thoughts. Our own thoughts can rob us of the joy of prayer, even very high states of prayer like the prayer of union, the prayer of quiet. If our thoughts are unchecked and we are not vigilant to keep our conscience pure, things get into our heart that rob us of the joy that the Lord would otherwise yearn for us to have. Wow, powerful. And it's a, it's a remedy to that fear ultimately, isn't it, Anthony? Yes. Yeah, to go back to what we first brought up at the beginning of our conversation together, the evil one always wants to rob us of the joy God yearns for us to have. So the evil one wants us to think that he's in control of the future. And so he whispers things to us that make us anxious and afraid and tries to intimidate us into doing something smaller than the great thing God would have for us. Well, you can see how that whole tactic is completely reliant on thoughts being unchecked and allowing impurities into our conscience. And you can also see 
that someone who's examining their conscience and who's paying attention to what's going on with the thoughts and surrendering every thought to Jesus, Jesus hold every thought captive. I want to rest in the Father's love, and I know this thought is not that I give it to you. Help me think on you. Help me think about the goodness of the Father. Help me think about the power of the Spirit and draw my confidence from that. This readiness make, keeps us humble enough to repent of the ugly thoughts that come up. This humility of doing this very uh, simple gesture puts us in the posture to be able to receive the graces that God wants to give us. These are, are powerful movements. She's plunging us into, in this chapter, a way to confront life with the goodness of God and with hope. She's helping us put together the elements that open up the future that God has for us. And that future opens up for us when we choose to believe in the goodness of God more than we believe in our own weakness and propensity to fail. When we believe in God's goodness more than our own weakness, God in our weakness is going to do great things. How beautiful, Anthony. Amen to all of that. You know, and just closing out this chapter, I mean, she she said, for those of you who they may not have that person to, to at least have that person within the context of a good spiritual work, just as you're going into prayer, it just have it there. And when your mind starts to wander, grab that work, that book, and just allow that to bring you back around, correct? Yes. She says this, and this is so filled with hope, and I, I think it's worth reading. May he be blessed for all this, for it has become clear to me that even in this life, he has not failed to reward me for any of my good desires. However wretched and imperfect my good works have been, this Lord of mine has been improving them, perfecting them, and making them of greater worth. And yet, hiding my evil deeds and my sin as soon as they have been committed, he has even allowed the eyes of those who have seen them to be blind to them and blots them out from their memory. He gilds my faults and makes some virtue of mine to shine forth in splendor. Yet it was he himself who gave it to me and almost forced me to possess it. God's it so at work in our lives. And we think we have a propensity to think that the what most defines what's going on in our hearts is the work of the evil one who stirs us to fear and our our own propensity towards sin. And we get discouraged and we don't try to keep our consciences pure and we just allow the evil one to work on us more and more. But what's really going on is quite the opposite. God is working with great power in our desires. He's blessing our noble desires and allowing them to bear fruit the more we surrender those to him. And as he blesses those things, he kind of loves us so much he hides our sins from the eyes of others there they see it right in front of their face and that's not what they see what they see instead is his goodness shining through us and what a good god we have how much good it does for us to learn to rest in his goodness and to trust that goodness and allow him to bring to completion in us the work he has begun amen thank you so much anthony Thank you, Chris. It's been a delightful conversation. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app or on whatever platform you obtain your podcasts. There, too, you can also listen to an audio version of the complete autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time 
for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis.